Thank you all for logging on and watching. My name is Kevin Schleich. I'm a pharmacist at the University of Iowa in the Family Medicine Clinic. And today we'll be talking about practical issues related to medication use in dementia. So part of my job over at the university is to work in our geriatrics clinic, and I've been fortunate enough to work with some of our, our best geriatricians uh, for the last three or four years. So this is something that's, that's very near to my heart and, uh, and I think important as the population is aging and something that's going to become more important going forward. So I do not have anything to disclose. The objectives for today, so we'll briefly start by talking about the background and the prevalence of dementia, uh, specifically in the United States. Some of the, the prevalence data includes worldwide information, but we'll predominantly focus on what's happening in the United States. Uh, at the end of the lecture, I hope you can understand the importance of conducting a thorough, th uh, thorough medication review and the appropriate steps that I think are involved when, when doing such review. Uh, I'll discuss the methods that I think help patients with dementia improve their medication adherence, so things like medication planners, uh, and we'll talk about some of the more in-depth ways that patients can remember to take their medications. And then finally, we'll talk about addressing specific goals of therapy for some chronic disease states that uh, oftentimes afflict our patients who have dementia and are also geriatric. So this is just a little bit of background information. As we should all know, there's a bunch of different causes of dementia. When we talk about the demographics and the epidemiology of dementia, I'll focus primarily on Alzheimer's dementia, strictly because that makes up the, the greatest percentage of causes of dementia. But as you should know, there are a bunch of different kinds of dementia. Regardless of what type of dementia your patient is diagnosed with, I think what we're going to talk about in this, this upcoming hour is relevant to any of those different causes. So it is very difficult to ascertain a good approximation of how many people are living with dementia. Like I said previously, most statistics do focus just strictly on Alzheimer's dementia. It's estimated that about 36 million people worldwide were living with dementia as of 2010, so granted that's six years ago. We can expect that that number is probably a little bit higher today in 2016, but that number is expected to double, at least double, uh, every 20 years going forward. So this is just a little bit of the epidemiology, again, focusing primarily on Alzheimer's dementia. Um, Alzheimer's dementia is a disease of aged individuals, as people aged 75 years of age and older account for more than 80% of all Alzheimer's cases. Additionally, Alzheimer's seems to be a disease that affects women a little bit more than men, as you can see from that bar graph. About two-thirds of patients with Alzheimer's dementia are actually women. So as I mentioned previously, the the incidence of dementia is expected to double every 20 years. So by 2030, there will be two times more people with dementia than what there were in 2010. And by 2050, it's estimated that there will be even two times more than that that there were in 2030. So by 2050, it's estimated that over 13.8 million Americans will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So the rest of this presentation is going to focus primarily on treating patients with dementia. So I think it's important when we talk about any kind of presentation where we're taking care of geriatrics patients, we, remind, re, we remember the first thing, and that's the most important thing, is that we do no harm. This is particularly true for patients with dementia as well. So additionally, when a patient presents with either new onset dementia or even long-standing dementia, as a pharmacist in the geriatric clinic, I take it upon myself to find out if there's any medications that have changed in the patient's medication regimen, anything that's been new or anything that's been added or increased, um, or even something that a patient's been on for a long period of time that might be contributing to their new onset cognitive impairment. So because of that, I'll spend a little bit of time here talking about why I think it's so important to obtain an accurate medication list. Um, each time we have a patient come into our clinic, one of our pharmacists meets with uh, a patient and their family and looks through the medications and goes through, this is kind of a step-by-step -step process that, that I think is important for obtaining a thorough medication history. So we start with making sure that each medication has an indication, following by making sure that each medication that a patient's taking is safe, and then that each medication that they're taking is effective and tolerated, and then we focus on if any of the, the current indications are not being treated. So we'll walk through each one of those steps just very briefly, uh, again, so I, so I make it clear how important I think a medication review is. So we'll illustrate this process of going through a medication review by using an actual patient. So MF is an 80-year-old female who reluctantly moved back to Iowa City to be closer to her family after her husband passed away within the past year. She was formally diagnosed with cognitive impairment in 2013, but her family believes her cognition has acutely worsened over the past three months. Additionally, she fell once in the past month, and as you can see here, her past medical history is rather significant. So we already mentioned that she has cognitive impairment. 
She also has a couple chronic disease states. So she has hypertension, hypothyroidism, insomnia. She suffers from depression and anxiety, which we mentioned has gotten a little bit worse uh, since the passing of her husband. She has Parkinsonism. She has osteoarthritis and chronic back pain. She's been complaining more so of diarrhea that's been chronic in nature, but she has an acute onset of, of some stomach pain. She had a hysterectomy in 1982 and cataracts removed in 2013. So this is a look at our patient's medication list. Uh, and for all of you who have seen geriatrics patients, this medication list doesn't actually look that impressive. Uh, she's only on nine medications and all of them look to be rather straightforward. So she's taking a couple things for that osteoarthritic pain. She's taking Tylenol and then hydrocodone and acetaminophen as well as a meloxicam tablet. She uses alprazolam as needed for that anxiety and insomnia that we talked about. She's been using amantadine for her Parkinson's, amlodipine for her hypertension, levothyroxine for her hypothyroidism, a potassium supplement, presumably for hypokalemia, and then denepazil at night for that cognitive impairment. Here's a look at her vitals when she was seen in clinic. So her blood pressure looked okay at 148 over 84. Her pulse was fine. Her labs looked pretty good. Her calcium was good, hemoglobin was good, and her TSH was fine. And then just a brief look at her electrolyte panel, seems like everything's in order. So as I mentioned, the first step in a thorough medication review is making sure that each medication has a legitimate indication. So the good news is that all these have arrows except for the last one. So we can pinpoint an indication for each of the medications except maybe that potassium supplement. Next slide, please. So if you remember, she was more closely hyperkalemic than hypokalemic with a potassium of 4.9. So we wanted to question how long she's been on the potassium and when this actually got started. So the next thing we need to focus on is the safety of medications. And fortunately, the last lecture series actually focused on the, the new Beers criteria. So I'm just going to briefly mention kind of how we use the, the Beers criteria in clinic to focus on safely using medications for patients. And we don't want to confuse the, the American Geriatric Society Beers criteria with this type of beer. So the Beers criteria, as you may know, is a consensus-based list of potentially inappropriate medications for older adults. I think it's important to remember that it's potentially inappropriate. We shouldn't look at the Beers criteria as a list of medications that we can absolutely never use in elderly patients. The most recent Beers criteria, like Jeff Reese spoke about a couple weeks ago, was published in 2015. And these guidelines do adhere to the Institute of Medicine's challenge of developing evidence-based guidelines. So the nice thing is the Beers criteria has remained a relatively constant length over the years. It's a 20-page document with nine reader-friendly tables. The first table is simply just a, an explanation of the evidence. So evidence A, level A evidence being the strongest evidence, and so forth. So I'll focus just briefly on the, the eight different tables and how these relate to how we take care of patients. So table two discusses medications and classes of medications that are potentially inappropriate for patients. So this is the meat of the guidelines where we talk about different medications and classes and how they relate to taking care of elderly patients. Table three specifically addresses medications that could potentially be inappropriate with specific disease states. So this was added in 2012 and was a very nice addition that gave a little bit more clinical practicality to the Beers criteria as opposed to just listing medications and encouraging people to stay away from them. This actually looked at specific disease states, disease states and when certain medications should be avoided in patients who have these disease states. So table four just lists medications that should be used cautiously in adults. This is actually what the Beers criteria used to look like prior to the 2012 update where it really just lists medications and things that we should think about when we're treating elderly adults. Table 5 is actually a new addition from the 2012 guidelines, and I think this is a very helpful addition. It focuses on specific drug-drug dr drug interactions that might be clinically significant for elderly patients. Table 6 is also new and focuses on drugs that may require dosage adjustments in elderly adults with compromised renal function. For those of us who have taken care of geriatrics patients, we know that it does not take much to give an acute insult to the kidneys. Something as little as dehydration can make the renal function go downhill very quickly. So this is a very nice table where we should be considering certain medications uh, as maybe potentially unsafe in that group of patients who have labile renal function. Tables in 7 and Table 8 are also new. Table 7 just lists drugs and classes of drugs that have anticholinergic proper properties. Obviously these are drugs that should probably be avoided, if possible, in geriatric patients. Table 8 discusses a few medications that have actually been reclassified since 2012. 
so either stronger evidence or weaker evidence than what they previously recommended. And then Table 9 just simply lists a few medications or conditions that have actually been removed from the guidelines since the 2012 update. So this slide actually focuses on utilizing the BEERS criteria for our specific patient. So the first slide is actually looking at the disease or syndromes that our patient has. So she has new onset cognitive impairment, relatively new onset cognitive impairment, I guess. And so if we look at some of these medications that are highlighted, we see that benzodiazepines come up on the list. So obviously this is a medication that has good evidence and a strong recommendation to avoid in patients with cognitive impairment. So this table is looking at specifically avoiding NSAIDs. So our patient is on meloxicam, as you can see it is highlighted there. So we want to avoid NSAIDs for a couple of reasons. First, as this table indicates, NSAIDs can be dangerous in patients from a GI standpoint. So they do make a specific recommendation that if patients do need long-term NSAIDs, if nothing else has worked for them, then they should be on some sort of gastric protection, so something like a PPI. Unfortunately, if you keep up with the literature in geriatric medicine, uh, and actually all medicine, PPI long-term use is really being questioned um, from a safety standpoint as well. Also specifically for this patient, she does have treated hypertension, and we know that NSAIDs can increase sodium retention, which can lead to worsening hypertensive control as well. Finally, we're looking at specifically this table concerning patients who have had falls or re recent fractures. Two of the medications that are on our patient's list show up in this table, and that's the benzodiazepines again, and then the opioids. So both of these medications, as we've already talked about, should probably be avoided if we can. So now that we've gone through a brief review of the BEERS criteria, we can relate that information to our specific patient. So I've given a little bit of a thumbs up or a thumbs down icon that shows which medications are at least thought to be safe in geriatric patients. So as you can see, there's, there's three medications in a row, and we talked about each of these specifically on the previous slides, but the hydrocodone and acetaminophen combination, the meloxicam and the alprazolam are potentially unsafe for our patient. I also put a, a thumbs up slash thumbs down for the amantadine because that may or may not be safe for a patient long term, but I think that's probably beyond the scope of, of this specific patient talk and kind of how we would use the beers criteria for this specific situation. So the third step of the medication review is to determine if each medication is effective for each indication that we're using it for. So I've broken down, and I won't go through each of these completely individually, but broken down the medications, and this is just information that we've obtained from the patient during the clinic visit. So this is something you actually have to sit down and ask the patient. So in terms of the pain medications, she's not really sure how well they're working because she is still having occasional pain. In terms of the anxiety and insomnia, she states that she never had any kind of issues sleeping prior to her husband passing away. She's unsure if the alprazolam's really helped her get to sleep as she still stays up at night and thinks about missing her husband and some other things in her life now that she's responsible for. Uh, she also says she's still depressed and she's unsure if that's still part of the normal coping process or not. She's been very happy with the amantadine. She feels like this has improved her tremor dramatically. Uh, she's previously been on carbidopa, levodopa and did not have a similar benefit with that medication. The amlodipine is effective. Her blood pressure today in clinic was 148 over 84. Uh, she does take her blood pressure at home, and she says they're much lower at home. She's just a little worked up about her visit today. The levothyroxine is, is working well. As we mentioned, her TSH is within the normal limits. Uh, she is on the potassium, and the potassium seems to be working, but if you remember, her potassium was 4.9, so she's much closer to that hyperkalemic stand. She's much closer to that hyperkalemic point than she is to the hypokalemic point. And then the, dep the, the Dinepazil, the family believes it was helping considerably until the most recent three months when they feel like she's had a little bit of a decline in her cognition. The fourth step is ensuring that each medication is being tolerated. So just because medications are in theory safe for patients does not necessarily mean that each patient tolerates them well. So she's tolerating the acetaminophen just fine, not having any side effects. She does not drink any alcohol, so we're not concerned with any kind of liver dysfunction. Um, in terms of the hydrocodone acetaminophen, she has had a fall, and the family really does complain. Their primary complaint is that she's having difficulties with memory recently. The meloxicam, she is being treated for hypertension, so that could be contributing to her hypertension. Additionally, she has a, a new complaint of more recent and acute GI upset, so the meloxicam could be contributing to that as well. Again, sticking with the fall, she has had one of those recently uh, and having problems with memory, so the benzodiazepine, the alprazolam, should be pointed at. The amanadine can cause, cause some diarrhea and GI upset, so that one's not totally devoid of any kind of adverse effects. 
The amlodipine, she's not having any lower extremity edema, not having any dizziness or lightheadedness, so that seems to be doing fine. No problems with the levothyroxine, and potassium is well known to cause some GI upset as well. And the denepazel seems to be fairly well tolerated, but again, can contribute to some GI issues as well. And then finally, the last thing we want to determine is if any indications are being untreated. So for this specific patient, she is still very depressed, and she has a reason to have some coping issues because her husband has just recently passed away, but she is very tearful in clinic. And the only medication she's taking currently that may help with any kind of uh, mood issues is the, is the alprazolam, and we know that that's not very well, not very good at treating depression. She does state that she's previously been on venlafaxine and mirtazapine. She's not sure how well those worked at the time. She doesn't feel like she was that depressed prior to her husband passing away. And then her osteoarthritis pain still is not very well controlled as she is complaining of relatively constant pain. So when I teach our pharmacy students how to do a medication review, we talk about breaking up these four steps into uh, a little bit of a tic-tac-toe board here. So I don't do this for every patient. I kind of do this in my mind. But this is something that we should look at and ways that we can determine if medications are safe for patients. So obviously if a medication doesn't have an indication, that's the easiest thing that we can do to take something off the list. So the potassium, like we mentioned, has a very questionable indication. Once we get beyond indications, I think it's important to look to see if there are any medications that show up in any of the following squares, but specifically if they show up in multiple squares. So the things that keep showing up, as you can see here, are the hydrocodone, the meloxicam, and the alprazolam. So they're potentially unsafe, uh, may not be working that well for a patient, and they may be contributing to some of her side effects. So when you see medications showing up in a number of these different quadrants, then it should jump to the top of your list for things that maybe need to be adjusted. So the next thing we need to focus on is the safety of medications. And fortunately, the last lecture series actually focused on the, the new Beers criteria. So I'm just going to briefly mention kind of how we use the, the Beers criteria in clinic to focus on safely using medications for patients. So our plan for our patient, I'd like to preface this slide by saying we strongly prefer to make just small changes at a time. We don't like doing a lot of changes at once. The problem with that is it's very difficult to determine what change has made a difference for the patient. However, when safety is a concern, we do sometimes have to make more than one change at a time. So for this particular patient, safety and worsening cognition was our primary issue. So we wanted to stop any medication that we thought could be potentially unsafe for her and could be potentially causing, uh, contributing to her worsening cognition. So it should come as no surprise that the ones that show up are the hydrocodone and the alprazolam. And then again, from a safety uh, standpoint, the meloxicam may not be the safest medication for her and doesn't seem to be working that well anyway. And then finally, the potassium we figured with a potassium of 4.9 probably is not necessary. So we were going to start acetaminophen and schedule that 1,000 milligrams three times a day to help with her back pain instead of just using it as needed. We're going to start sertraline, 25 milligrams daily for her depression and anxiety. We decided that we did not want to go back to the venlafaxine. She, she was not sure if it worked that well, and it does have a known potential to increase the blood pressure. And then we're also going to start lidocaine patches every 12 hours to help with, the, uh, uh, to help with that osteoarthritic pain as well. So in follow-up, uh, we were able to decrease her number of medications from 9 to 7, so a little bit of an improvement. Her potassium in two weeks was 3.9, so it was still normal without taking the potassium supplementation. We did end up increasing the sertraline up to 50 milligrams in six weeks because she still felt like she was having some depressive issues. But her family felt that her mind was much less cloudy and they reported no more falls, which is beneficial. So the next portion of this talk will, will focus on medication adherence. So this is a problem uh, with all patients, not necessarily just geriatric patients and not necessarily just patients with dementia, but in all patients. So there's a number of different ways we can help improve medication adherence, and we'll talk about some of the ways we can improve adherence by adjusting the medication regimen, but also talking about some ways that we can improve adherence by providing some tools to the patient and the family. So the problem is, as patients age, most have some impairment in either dexterity, mobility, hearing, and or vision, and oftentimes those problems are multifold. So each of these alone can be a barrier to medication adherence, and when added to progressing dementia, adherence becomes increasingly more problematic. 
So as dementia worsens, the ability to plan accordingly, organize complex plans, and execute meticulous tasks diminishes. I think you can argue that when patients get even more than one or two medications, uh, it can be considered complex and a meticulous task as well. So non-adherence to medications has been shown to worsen therapeutic outcomes, increase medical interventions, increase the incidence of adverse effects, and increase hospitalizations, all of which are bad things, obviously. So there's two things we can do to improve medication adherence, like I had mentioned. The first thing that tends to be very effective is to simplify the medication regimen. We'll talk about a couple ways that we can simplify medication regimens. The second thing we can do is recommend assistive measures. There's a number of different things that we can use for assist assistive measures. Some of them are very cheap and non-intrusive, like just medication boxes and reminders on phones. Some of them are much more expensive and technologically advanced. Uh, things like the MD2 machines that will dispense the medication and set an alarm for the patient to take them and can alert family members when the, when the patients don't take the medication. So we'll go through each of those options as well. So I think an easy thing that we should always consider in terms of improving adherence is to simplify medication regimens. The first thing that we can do to simplify the medication regimen we have already talked about. So complete a comprehensive medication review and see what things can either be stopped or changed that can improve patient adherence. We should utilize combination medications if appropriate. So if a patient's on two, med two blood pressure medications, there's a potential that we can combine those in a commercially available product that uses two medications at once. We can also switch to extended release formulations, again, if appropriate. So instead of taking metformin a couple times a day, you can switch to just taking it once a day. And then I think it's important, exploit may not be the best word, but I think we should utilize people's personal habits to help improve adherence. So for example, if we have a patient who likes to drink tea in the afternoon, if she needs an afternoon medication, you can remind her that when she sits down to drink her tea, she can go ahead and just take that medication at that time as well. So again, let's utilize another patient to help reiterate how we can simplify medication regimen. So LZ is a 76-year-old female who has a past medical history significant for hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and mild cognitive impairment. Her current medication list actually looks even smaller than our last patient, so you may not think that this is necessarily a medication list that needs simplifying. So she takes hydrochlorothiazide daily, lisinopril daily, metformin three times a day with meals, glipizide twice daily, and denepazil at bedtime. So when talking to her, she does state that taking medications at different times throughout the day has become burdensome to her, and she would like to just take less or no medications. So this is just a look at what her current medication pillbox would look like. So as I'd mentioned, she's taking the metformin three times per day. She's taking the hydrochlorothiazide and the glipizide twice per day. And she's also taking that denepazil at night. So she's taking four medications in the morning, one at noon, and three at night. So there's a couple things we can very easily do to simplify her medication regimen without changing either doses or efficacy of these medications. So we can give her a lisinopril hydrochlorothiazide combination tablet. Again, this would give her the same amount of blood pressure medications just in one tablet. We could have her switch to the extended release metformin and just take that once a day. We could also switch to the extended release glipizide and have her take that once a day. Unfortunately, the denepazil does work best at bedtime. Uh, again, from a tolerability standpoint, it can make patients a little drowsy as well, so we should probably keep that at bedtime. But if you look at what her medication regimen and her pill box might look like after we make the simplification, she's still taking four tablets in the morning, but nothing at noon and only one tablet at night. So we got rid of that noon dose, which she said she did not specifically like taking. So that's a, a bit of a simplification. Unfortunately, we weren't, we weren't able to get rid of any medications, but I think you could argue that each of those medications are necessary for this patient. So switching gears from talking about simplifying the medication to utilizing tools to improve adherence, we'll start with the cheapest and easiest form of medication reminders and work our way through the, the hierarchy to the most complex and the most expensive agents that we can recommend. So the med box, I'm sure everyone's familiar with these. These are relatively cheap. Depending on how fancy of a one you want to get, they range anywhere between three and probably twenty dollars. They're very easy to use. Uh, there's a large variation. They used to come in just one pill box for seven days, but now they have single dose, single days, all the way up to four times daily dosing, and you can set it up for a full week. The nice thing about these is that they're easy to change a drug regimen. So you can just ask the patient to take a medication out of the day or add something else in as needed. 
So there are some disadvantages to the med boxes. They do require adequate cognition to set up the pill boxes. So the patient does have to have some sort of uh, adequate cognition to set these up themselves. If the patient does not have adequate cognition, they need someone else who can help them. So either nursing services or a family member that could do it once a week. Unlike some of the other things that we'll talk about, there's really no system to actually remind patients to take the doses. So they still have to remember to take the medications every morning and every night. And then there's no feedback when there's missed doses. So uh, if family's coming over to set them up once a week, it would be at weekly intervals that they may figure out that mom or dad forgot to take their Wednesday and Thursday doses. Moving up the ladder a little bit, so a number of pharmacies offer to prepack medications for patients. An advantage of this is it's relatively cheap. Pharmacies will generally charge a weekly or a monthly fee for this service. Additionally, it removes the burden of preparing the medications from the patient or the family. So you can ensure accuracy that these are getting set up correctly. Some disadvantages, so not all pharmacies offer the services. Traditionally, these have been kind of the smaller town pharmacies that have offered this and not necessarily the big chain pharmacies. This will be an added monthly cost, so this could be problematic for patients who are on a fixed income. Additionally, there's, again, no system to actually remind the patient to take the doses. And this can be very difficult to make dose changes. So especially if a patient has a monthly pill card set up and you need to make an adjustment to a dose of anything, uh, it can be difficult to do. So you may have to have them take their medication card back into the pharmacy. They may have to either completely repack it or cut a hole and then tape over it. So something that comes to mind quite frequently is warfarin when we have to make dosage adjustments on that and a patient needs to take their medication card back to their pharmacy to get that dose adjusted immediately. So move on to the automated devices. Unfortunately, R2-D2 uh, does not dispense medications, uh, but I think he'd be pretty good at it if he did. So some of these things do look like R2-D2 though. So uh, these have again both advantages and disadvantages. So the advantages to this are that they offer both a monitored and a standalone option. So you can get this for a patient and it can be set up to either their pharmacy or a family member who's alerted when the patient does not take their medications. You can also get it where it does not have that function and it just sets off an alarm for the patient to take the medication. Again, the monitored option allows for either a text message, a phone call, or an email to be sent to the person who's de designated to know. Oftentimes that's a family member. Um, and this can coordinate with pharmacies as well, so doing refills uh, and some pharmacies even offer this service. The biggest disadvantage is that these machines are expensive. So they range anywhere from $400 to $2,000 for the machine alone. And then there's usually a monthly fee for the monitoring service if you choose to go that route. These can be very difficult to set up. Uh, each of these machines comes with a, a pretty intense instruction manual. So this can be very difficult for specifically a patient to use, but also even a family member as well. So in terms of improving the medication adherence for, for all patients, but specifically patients with dementia, the first thing that we need to do is evaluate their cognition to help determine what their ability is to manage their own medications. In clinic, we often use the, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test or the MOCA, uh, and if the patients score well, then we know that they can at least, uh, in theory, manage their own medications. If they score poorly, we, we realize that we need to get some sort of help for the patient in terms of checking and taking their medications. So if that's in-home nursing services or assisted living or family members help, uh, that's something that we can recommend. We additionally want to assess the family and community support. So some people have a lot of available options to help support them. Unfortunately, some people don't have anything. Um, so we want to look for competent and willing family members look to see if they qualify for any kind of in-home nursing services, and then see what pharmacies are available that could provide some of these services at a cost that's reasonable for the patient as well. And then based on that information, we need to determine what the best plan is to maximize medication adherence. So the last portion of this talk will focus on treating chronic diseases, specifically in patients who have dementia. So there's four main principles of treating chronic disease states in, in chronic, and start over. So there's four main principles in treating chronic disease states in elderly patients, and specifically patients with dementia. So first of all, we need to establish goals of care with the patient and their family members. We need to establish if they want to use intensive treatments to prolong life for as long as possible, or if they just want to make themselves comfortable. Second of all, we need to achieve acceptable goals without causing undue treatment burden. Third, we want to continuously assess therapy for safety, efficacy, and tolerability because just because a medication regimen was working two years ago does not necessarily mean that it's going to be effective and tolerable down the line. And then fourth and finally, we do have to be willing to de-escalate therapy. We need to be willing to back off doses uh, if patients are having adverse effects. 
So basically, we're trying to obtain a very fine balance of treating conditions that can present an acute danger to the patient and also avoiding side effects that can become detrimental and worsen the quality of life. So we'll talk about some very specific disease states, ones that most frequently uh, affect our geriatric patients. So depression and anxiety is unfortunately the most common mental disorder in geriatrics patients. It's estimated that about 40% of patients with Alzheimer's dementia also have depression. We utilize the geri geriatric depression scale in clinic to help screen patients. However, one thing to keep in mind is when people have advanced dementia, the geriatric depression scale really is not of much utility. Treatment of depression, much like treatment of depression in all ages of people, revolves around using SSRIs. So sertraline is my favorite SSRI that we should use in geriatrics patients, and I'll show you basically why it is and its reason of exclusion. So it's because we dislike the other SSRIs for a couple uh, different reasons. So like most medications in geriatrics patients, we want to start with a low dose and titrate that dose slowly. I think it's important to keep in mind that we do want to give a full six-week trial of a dose to make sure a patient gets that full trial of the medication. So paroxetine is not our favorite medication to use in geriatric patients because it has a very short half-life. So in a group of patients that has a propensity to miss doses for one reason or another, they may develop withdrawal symptoms with even just a miss, one missed dose. Fluoxetine, on the other hand, has a very, very long half-life. So if patients run into problems with side effects like drowsiness or issues like that, it can take a long time for that medication to get out of their system. Additionally, citalopram, uh, somewhat recently, within the past couple of years, has been associated with prolonged QT intervals. Uh, so maybe is not the best choice of an agent for a patient who may have a cardiac dysfunction as well. I think it's important to keep in mind that mirtazapine can be helpful for both depression, insomnia, and appetite stimulation. So kind of use the old adage of killing two birds with one stone. So insomnia. Many patients with dementia also have trouble with insomnia. Unfortunately, no prescription medications work very well for insomnia, and all of them have the potential for serious adverse effects. So this always seemed cliche when we learned about it in school, but sleep hygiene is really, really important to, to focus on with these patients. So some things that we really focus on with these patients is that they should increase physical activity throughout the day. They should avoid long naps, specifically close to bedtime. Only use the bedroom for sleep, so we don't want them reading in there or watching TV or sewing or doing anything like that in the bedroom. And then also limit caffeine and alcohol intake. So there's certain medications that we can try that seem to be safer than other medications. So melatonin uh, is available over the counter. At three milligrams is a good starting dose for that. Generally is very well tolerated by patients. Unfortunately, it's, it seems to be about of a flip of a coin in terms of how well it works for patients. Some patients seem to love it. Some patients don't think it works very well at all. But I think it is worth a trial, especially because it is very, very well tolerated. Trazodone can help. Uh, again, starting at a low dose and working our way up if needed. Mirtazapine, I already mentioned, can be very useful for patients who have concurrent depression and also maybe could use some weight gain. And then nortriptyline can be beneficial as well. I think it's important that if we do use a TCA, so a tricyclic antidepressant, we focus on using nortriptyline instead of amitriptyline because nortriptyline is less anticholinergic. So there's certain medications we should absolutely avoid. One of the big ones that we focus on is diphenhydramine, and this goes back to taking a very thorough medication history and really focusing on making sure patients uh, are taking safe over-the-counter medications as well. So all over-the-counter PM medications, so things that are marketed as PM medications, have diphenhydramine in them, which is very unsafe for elderly patients to take. Uh, young patients often complain of drowsiness and next-day issues with diphenhydramine, and the metabolism of diphenhydramine slows down dramatically as we age, so patients have long-term problems with that if they use it on any kind of consistent basis. Also, we'd prefer to stay away from things like zolpidem and benzodiazepines as well, strictly due to an adverse effect profile. So switching gears a little bit, but focusing again on a, on a disease state that, fo that afflicts a lot of our geriatric patients, and that's type 2 di diabetes. So I think we have to remember that the most important part of tight glycemic control in adults is that we're looking to avoid long-term complications. And some of these long-term complications are not necessarily as relevant in our patients who are 80 and 90 years of age. So patients of advanced age with numerous comorbid conditions will have different goals of care than our 40-year-old person who's di diagnosed with diabetes. So this image is a, a, very, a very nice uh, image put forth by the American Diabetes Association. 
And this focuses on what glycemic, control, what glycemic goals we should have for certain patients. And there's a number of different things we should take into account as to how strict of an A1C goal we should have for people. So a lot of these things, as you'll see by these check marks, uh, really do apply to our geriatric patients. So the first thing is risks associated with episodes of hypoglycemia. So we know this is one of the most important things to avoid in geriatric people. So because they have such a high risk of developing and having adverse effects from hypoglycemia, we certainly want to have a more uh, lenient A1C goal. Additionally, disease duration. So we found that treating diabetes aggressively for people who have had the disease for a short period of time, uh, generally those people do better. However, if you've had the uh, diabetes for a long period of time, treating very aggressively has not been shown to improve outcomes significantly. So in our patients who are 80 and 90 years of, years of age, they've generally probably had diabetes for a long period of time, and again would warrant a less strict A1C goal. The next thing is life expectancy. So unfortunately, as we get into our eighth and ninth decade of life, we don't have the same life expectancy as we do in our, when we are in our third and fourth decade of life. So this one is pretty self-explanatory. The next one is important comorbidities. So this is a number of other disease states that could be affecting how aggressive we can be with our diabetes treatment. And oftentimes our geriatric patients have a number of other comorbidities as well. The next one is established vascular complications. And again, patients of geriatric age may or may not have this. This is not absolutely guaranteed. Uh, we see geriatric patients with very good vasculatures. So this is not necessarily guaranteed, but something that could be kept in mind as well. So the next one is patient attitude and expected treatment efforts. So this is again um, something where a lot of geriatric patients just do not want to give themselves insulin. They'd prefer to just take a metformin and not check their blood sugar, uh, which again is probably reasonable to, to lean towards a much less stringent A1C goal. So I think we need to remember that with the increased A1C goal, so if we have a patient who has an A1C goal of eight as opposed to seven, we need to adjust the blood sugar goals as well. So if you do still have your patient checking fasting or pre or postprandial blood sugars and you have them with an A1C, of, an A1C goal of eight, their goal shouldn't be the same as they, they were when they had an A1C goal of seven. So with the A1C of seven, we expect fasting blood sugars to be between 70 and 130 milligrams per deciliter. Obviously you can raise that with a less strict A1C goal. And the same goes for both pre and postprandial goals as well. So just like everything else, I think it's important that we utilize medications with convenient dosing regimens and a low risk of hypoglycemic events. So metformin once a day uh, is a very convenient dosing regimen. And I'll talk about on this next table the importance of being cognizant of, of renal function and actually how our, our feelings with renal function have changed a little bit recently with, uh, with some new labeling of metformin. So sulfonylureas. Uh, work by stimulating the pancreas to produce more insulin. So obviously the risk of hypoglycemia is much more significant with sul sulfonylureas than metformin. Um, I would strongly, strongly suggest that we avoid gliburide in all of our geriatric patients. So gliburide, as opposed to glipizide and glimepiride, has an active metabolite that is renally excreted. That active metabolite increases the risk of hypoglycemia. And as we've already mentioned, our geriatric patients oftentimes have either impaired renal function or have a propensity to get impaired renal function. So I would suggest again that we avoid gliburide and just stick with glipizide or glimepiride. So as this table shows, uh, we used to get it drilled into our head that if a patient had a certain serum creatinine, they should never be on metformin. So if the serum creatinine was 1.4 or 1.5, they should not be on metformin. However, uh, a study that was published in 2011, so not even a relatively new study, but has gained some new attention, uh, has actually helped change the prescribing guidelines for metformin. So instead of focusing on serum creatinine, we're actually focusing on a number that more truly represents what a patient's actual renal function is. So that's looking at estimated GFR. Um, so instead of just having this arbitrary serum creatinine number, we should focus on what the patient's GFR is. If their estimated GFR is greater than 45 mils per minute, we should continue metformin without any kind of concern. If their GFR, however, is less than 30, we should probably consider discontinuing metformin because the risk of lactic acidosis does increase. And then there's that gray area, so if the GFR is between 30 and 45, you should probably max the, the daily dose of the metformin at 1,000 milligrams per day as opposed to 2,000 milligrams per day. But I think this is an important thing where we are oftentimes taking away metformin 
from a group of patients that really could benefit from it the most. And again, it's a relatively safe medication that doesn't have the same risk of hypoglycemia as a lot of our other agents do. So I think you can consider some of the newer agents in our geriatric patients. Uh, the DPP-4 inhibitors are once daily and they're oral, so they have an advantage over the GLP-1 agonists that are either once or twice daily or once weekly, but are injectables. Um, in terms of which medications from the classes are best, they've all shown to have similar efficacy. For the DPP-4s, linagliptin does not require any kind of renal adjustment, so maybe the best dose, maybe the best medication for patients with renal concerns. Uh, and then dulaglutide of the GLP-1 agonists is in the same boat. Uh, dulaglutide is also a little bit easier to use than the albaglutide or the tansium, uh, which requires a couple preparation steps and some patience as well. If you do need to use insulin, basal insulin, things like Lantus and Levomir is obviously much safer than the bolus insulin, the things like Humalog and Novolog uh, that you use with meals. So moving on to hypertension, a number of patients, specifically geriatric patients, have hypertension. Uh, an important thing to realize is that we don't want to overtreat hypertension, especially in patients with dementia as well. So treating to a goal blood pressure of less than 150 over 90 is absolutely perfect. Uh, the SPRINT trial recently came out and showed that maybe we should be focusing on blood pressures closer to 120, specifically systolic blood pressures. But I don't think that includes our patients who have advanced comorbidities and things like dementia. So in a group of patients where we want to avoid dizziness and lightheadedness and falls at all costs, uh, we want to make sure that we're not driving the blood pressure too low. We should also choose agents carefully that sh will not exacerbate conditions that are common in our elderly patients. So things like amlodipine can worsen lower extremity edema. Granted, that's not a dangerous side effect. It can be a bothersome one to patients. Diuretics can increase the propensity for patients to get dehydrated and lead to some renal dysfunction. And then beta blockers are, are well known to cause and contribute to orthostatic hypotension. So atrial fibrillation, this is a difficult condition to treat in our geriatric patients. Next slide, please. So as this shows, atrial fibrillation is most definitely a disease of elderly patients. So AFib affects about 1% of the general population but 6% of patients 65, year, of year, 65 years of age and older. It's still important that we utilize the CHADS-2 or the CHADS-VASC score to stratify embolic risk for elderly patients with atrial fibrillation. However, I think it's equally, if not more important, to use validated bleed risk scores to predict the risk of complications associated with using anticoagulants in these patients. So a couple bleed risk scores you may be familiar with are the HASBLED and then the MOBRI, which is the Modified Outpatient Bleed Risk Index Score. So when looking at these agents, it's important to weigh both the pros and cons of all of the agents. So warfarin's the agent that we've had forever, has been around forever, and is probably most comfortable for people to use. The pros with warfarin, it's affordable, uh, it's readily revert reversible with vitamin K, and you don't have to make any kind of dose adjustments for patients who have renal or hepatic disease. It is once, day dose, once daily dosing as well. The cons are very well known. Uh, it requires routine follow-up and monitoring and requires some, side, some sort of dietary consistency. Now this is a, a little bit of a misnomer that patients believe they have to stay away from lettuce and spinach and things like that. They do not. Uh, they just have to be consistent with their vitamin K intake. So looking at the newer agents, so dabigatran is the oldest of the new agents, the first one that came out on the market, and I think that's probably the only benefit it has over the other agents that are available. So dabigatran, like all the new agents, requires no routine monitoring. A pro of, the, of dabigatran compared to the other new agents is that, it, is that it does have a commercially available reversal agent, uh, I dare you, Sizumab. So it does have a reversible agent, which is very beneficial for patients who do develop bleeding complications. However, dabigatran is still my least favorite of these medications. Uh, like all of them, it's expensive. And compared to the other new medications, it's 80% 80, 80 renally cleared. So we've seen patients run into problems with dabigatran quite frequently, specifically patients who have had an uh, acute renal insult uh, and the medication accumulates and causes some problems. Dabigatran also has a downfall that it's twice daily dosing. So rivaroxaban uh, is the next agent. Uh, has an advantage over dabigatran in that it's once daily dosing. Again, it's very expensive. It's less renally cleared than the dabigatran. Uh, and unfortunately, it has no reversal agent yet. 
So rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban do not yet have a reversal agent, but there is one that's coming very, very soon, I would imagine. Uh, apixaban is probably my favorite in terms of efficacy and safety of the new agents. The biggest downfall is that it is twice daily dosed, so it's less convenient than the rivaroxaban and the adoxaban. But in terms of safety and efficacy, it's shown the best efficacy and the best safety compared to any of the other new agents. And then finally, adoxaban is the newest, which I'm the least familiar with. Uh, it has a very similar pharmacokinetic profile as apixaban, but does have the advantage over the apixaban in that it's once daily dosing. So I think another misconception with the new agents is that they're good for patients who have problems being adherent to warfarin. It's actually more important that patients are adherent to the new agents. Uh, they've shown that missing even one dose can increase the risk of developing strokes and blood clots in patients who are more susceptible to blood clots um, because of its short onset and offset. Um, unfortunately, so one of the big marketing ploys for these agents is that you can monitor or that they do not require monitoring. However, you also cannot monitor them. So you're not sure if the patient is therapeutic or if they're having side effects or whatnot. Uh, and like I said, intermittent adherence or discontinuation actually increases the risk of embolism. So now we're going to focus on ASCVD, which is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, the disease that was previously known as hyperlipidemia. So with this disease, treating with statins is kind of where we've been led to go with the new guidelines. However, treating with statins for primary prevention is looking to reduce 10-year risk. And utilizing a medication to pot potentially prevent an event over 10 years may not be the most practical in a patient who has dementia. Additionally, statins have loosely and probably inaccurately been associated with dementia. The most recent literature does lean towards statins neither causing nor uh, preventing dementia to any significant degree. So just in summary, when focusing on goals of treatment with patients, we want to first establish goals of care with both the patient and their family members. We don't want to be treating very aggressively when patients are not looking for that. Additionally, we want to achieve acceptable goals, so things that we've agreed upon with the family without causing any kind of undue treatment burden. Uh, for example, preventing uh, stroke by treating atrial fibrillation, I think that's very, very important, uh, especially when patients want to avoid having a stroke at all costs, uh, as opposed to minimizing 10-year cardiovascular risk with statins. So, you know, maybe preventing a heart attack over 10 years in a patient who's already 92 years old. Uh, number three, we want to continuously assess therapy for safety and efficacy. Again, like I said, uh, we want to make sure that just because a medication regimen was safe five years ago, we want to make sure that it's continuously safe for patients. Uh, additionally, we have some tools that can help us with that. So, for example, we may not choose to anticoagulate a patient who has a CHADS-2 score of 1 but has a HASBLOOD score of 5. The risks of starting therapy probably would far outweigh the potential benefit of using therapy in that patient. And then, as always, we need to be willing to de-escalate therapy. So in summary, dementia is currently affecting more than 35 million people worldwide with expectations that that number will double every 20 years. So it's essential, like I said, to complete a thorough medication review for patients with dementia. Additionally, adherence to complex medication regimens is very unlikely in these patients. Therefore, simpli simplification is necessary. We should simplify the medication regimen and provide tools that can help improve medication adherence for those patients. I think it's very important that we intimately know what our patients' goals of therapy are and tailor their treatment to best accomplish those goals. So with that, that concludes the presentation. I'd like to thank you for listening and hope you enjoyed the presentation.